There we Are go. we live? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's afternoon Pacific time here on the West Coast. Pacific time, 1 p.m. I'm Jill Zandi. I'm the Mate Center's Associate Director and Competition Coordinator, and I'm here with Competition Technical Manager Matt Gardner. Hi, everyone. And we are bringing you another Facebook Live event. Very exciting. Matt is going to demonstrate, give you an overview, and take you through the Ranger Class Competition Props, the 2018 Ranger Class Competition Props. So if you're competing in the Ranger Class, these are the props that you will see on Competition Day. And not only will you be able to see them and see Matt demonstrate them, but you're going to be able to ask questions and get answers from Matt live, 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 live. So be sure that you're in front of your computer, you got your keyboard ready, and you're ready to ask questions because we like questions. So we did Scout, we did Navigator prop demonstrations. If you miss those, don't worry, they'll be posted on the Mate Center website, and they're also still on our competition Facebook page, so don't worry about that. Um, we'll do Explorer coming up in the month of February. We have a bit of travel coming up, so we'll hit Explorer probably mid-February, you think? Yeah, it depends. Yeah. Mid-February. So, but just to make sure that you don't miss any time we go live, you're going to want to hit the subscribe button. You should see that on your screen, subscribe, and that way every time we'll go, we go live, you'll get a notification and you won't miss a thing because we actually, we may go live next week when yes. we're at um, Underwater Intervention, a conference and exhibition in New Orleans. So that should be exciting. Um, like last time when we did the Navigator prop demonstration, we are in the lecture forum, a lecture forum room here at Monterey Peninsula College. And Dylan, once again, is our camera, camera Everyone. person. <laughs> He's just showing his camera. Um, Dylan is one of our Seamate students. He basically manages our Seamate store. And speaking of, if you plan to order any of our products and use them in the competition, our kits, any of the accessories, make sure you get your order in soon. We don't want to hold you up or get you behind when it comes to preparing for the competition. So just remember, get your order in. Dylan will ship them out to you soon. <laughs> so all that said, I think we're, we're good. I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Here we go. Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, as Jill said, we're gonna run through all the missions of product demonstrations today, and uh, feel free to, to write in your questions. I will answer them as best as I am able to. Um, now today, I am gonna run through things in order, just because that's how I'm gonna do it. But at the end, I'm gonna talk some, I'm gonna talk more about the order you can do things, because technically you can do various things in in different order. So, okay, we're gonna start, and we're gonna start with task one airplanes. And actually, the first part of task one airplanes is using flight data to determine the search zone. So on your table, you're going to get something like this. It's going to have the location of takeoff, heading, airspeed on ascent, the ascent rate, the time until engine failure, airspeed descent, the descent rate, Wind direction, wind speed. So you're getting a lot of information. And just so you know, your wind speed will be typed in and won't be handwritten in. I just forgot that. And so one other note, I'm not sure if this was in the manual or not, but um, we did this for Explorer, but the wind is only going to affect you on the way down. So on the way up, the pilot still control, has control of the plane and is compensating for the wind. So the wind is only going to affect you on your descent vector. So we're going to work through this problem here. So I uh, hopefully you can see this. If not, the first thing is, Time until engine failure, one minute, five seconds. So we're gonna convert that to seconds. So one minute and five seconds equals 65 seconds. Now we're gonna use the air, air speed is 141 meters per second, times 65 seconds. So on the ascent, as it's moving up, this plane moved 9.165 meters. We're gonna call that 9.2 kilometers. Now, I don't really need it for this part, but I also wanna find out how high the airplane gets. So for this one, we're gonna use the ascent rate which is 9.4 meters per second, again, times 65 seconds. So we get a height of 611 meters. So the plane made it 9.2 meters out, 611 meters up, okay? And so that's our first vector, 9.2 kilometers at 187 degrees. And so from the map, you're also gonna get a map on your table. And from the key down here, I know that this distance for one kilometer is about point seven centimeters. And so I'm gonna do the math. If one kilometer equals 0.7 centimeters and we moved 9.2 kilometers, 9.2 times 0.7. So what I know is on our ascent vector going up, 
the plane moved 6.4 centimeters on our map at 187. So I'm going to come over here, and our, of course our takeoff point was Naval Air Station Sandpoint. So I said 187 degrees. So let's see, 180 is due south, so seven more than 180. So right about there's five, six, seven. So it's going down this way, this direction, I should say. And we said, as I said, 6.4 centimeters on the map. So I'm going to get this out. Line it up, 6.4 centimeters gets me right there. So my first vector, 6.4 centimeters is right there, and that's the ascent vector, okay? So the reason we also determined height is because we're gonna use the height to determine how far down it goes. So we know we have 611 meters of high. The descent rate is 6.6 .6 meters per second. So I'm just gonna do some math, 611 divided by 6.6, .6, and that gets me, the plane is now going down for 93 seconds, okay? We also know how fast it was moving going down is 82 meters per second. So we're going 93 seconds times 82 meters per second. So essentially, it's going down distance-wise, 7.626 meters, we're gonna call that 7.6 kilometers. And again, it's moving the same direction, 187. So we know, again, one kilometer equals 0 0.7. So essentially, on the way down, on this map, it is going 5.3 centimeters in that same direction, 187. So, let me actually, actually, let me keep drawing that line a bit. So it's going out this way. And what I say, we're going 5.3 centimeters. So, 5, 5.3 centimeters puts this plane right about there. So that's our descent vector. But now there's some wind involved as well. Okay, yeah, let me straighten that up. So the wind, that only affects them on the descent, and we decided, well, we determined, calculated, that it was going down for 93 seconds. So this plane is experiencing 93 seconds in the wind, and the wind is 27.7 meters per second. So what that means is the wind is actually pushing this plane, 93 times 27.7, 2.58 kilometers, and the wind direction, the wind is from 292. Now that's where it's from, so it's actually pushing you the opposite way. So I'm gonna subtract 180 from that, and I believe that gets us to 112. Yep, so our wind vector is pushing from 292, but that means it moves us in 112 degrees. So we're moving 2.58 kilometers, 112 degrees. So 2.58 times 0.7, because that's what it is on the map. So I need to move 1.8 centimeters in 112. So let's see, 112 is, well, 90 would be due east. So it's a little south of that. So we're gonna say, let's see, if 90, let me line that up a little better. So 90, 100, 110, so 112 would be right about that direction. So we're gonna be moving out this direction. Oops, let me get to centimeters. And I said we're moving about 1.8 centimeters. So there's 1.8 to right about there. So this is actually where the plane landed. And it's kind of hard to see on there, but you can you can need to tell the judge what zone. So this zone is zone seven where it lands. So what you need to do, tell your judge, is all your vectors. So your, your ascent vector was 9.2 kilometers at 187 degrees or 6.4 centimeters on the map. That got you to there. Your descent vector was 7.6 um, kilometers or 5.3 centimeters so that got us to there and then your wind vector was 1.8 centimeters um, on this map at 112 and so that's how you get your results so you need to tell the judges kind of show them that you did the work on all three of these now this was a lot of math so we're going to come on over here and I'm going to show you question. Yeah. question Gavin yes. hey Gavin hey, Gavin. Hey, Gavin. Gavin wants to know do we also get the paper he is using to calculate or just the known no information? no you are going to get this information, which has all the data, and then this is just something I did, so you're not going to get this. You're going to have to do this yourself. But if you don't want to do all those calculations, you could set up an Excel program, and I'm going to show you now. I'm not going to give you my Excel program. If you want to do this, you can make your own program. Okay? Don't reveal that secret, I'm not going to do yes. So, so here is the program I made. So essentially, it's just doing all those calculations for me. So I would type in the data. So I actually wrote it on the side just so I wouldn't have to go get that sheet. But the heading was 187. Our airspeed ascent was 141. 
Our ascent rate was 9.4. Our ascent time was 65 seconds. And one kilometer on the map, as I measured, was 0.7 centimeters. And so right now, this has got me, this is what I need for the ascent vector. So now my ascent distance was 9.165 meters. We said 9.2, so that's pretty close. And we got to 611 height at 187 degrees. So this is now that first ascent vector. A little bit quicker. So now, for the descent vector, typing in 6.6 for, that's the descent rate. 82 was our descent speed. And that gets me, let's see, yep. So there this pops up. So our descent distance was 7. 0.591, 7.6 uh, kilometers or 5.3 centimeters on the map. And this one was, the uh, first one was 6.4. So this is just doing all the math for me. And then finally, our wind speed was 27.7. And the wind blew us to 112 degrees. And again, it gives me the distance on the map, 1.79, 1.8 centimeters at 112 degrees. So I have this set up essentially to do my math for me. So you can bring a computer, a laptop, you can do this on your phone, however you want to set it up. If you want to have a program that does this for you and figures out the math, that's great. You know, you don't have to be doing it there. Okay? Any questions about the math so far? No, Hopefully, I... Gavin was um, in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, I, know, I was going to ask. Yeah, awesome. I hope yeah. DBXL is working. I just did a workshop there and met the, some uh, students who awesome. are going to be doing it. So, hey, Gavin, hope, hope you're having a good time. Okay, okay. great question. So, yeah. My team wrote a program to calculate and draw the three vectors on screen. Do we have to print the map out with vectors or just show it to a station judge? Nope, nope. If, if you have this map and you're showing, essentially, your map should look something like this. But you need to show the map, number one, the vectors, but just show, hey, vector one got me to here, vector two got me to here, vector three got me here. So if you are doing this on your own screen and you just type in the numbers and it does all this work for you, that would be ideal. Okay. Awesome. So, moving on. So, I do want to say, you do need to do this before you start going down and working on any of the other airplane tests. You can skip this, but if you skip it, you can't come back and do it again. Okay? So, the next thing is, you're going to have to identify the aircraft using its tail structure. So, aircraft engine, and somewhere over here, is a tail structure. So, get this. This is what it's going to look like. You just need to see this in your camera. And you're going to notice kind of both the shape and the number on there. So, RL96. And then on your station, you're going to have a Ranger Aircraft Identification Handbook. Now, just since I kind of know these, I know that this tail structure, without any curves, that's kind of narrowed it down to three. So this is either a Corsair, it could be a Hellcat, or it could be a Mustang. And I think just from the shape it is, I think this is a Corsair. So I'm going to go right to that page. And yeah, so why don't we come on over to the table here. And this is what matches up. So this is kind of what the tail structure looks like. And the number was RL96. So you're going to just go down and go, yep, there it is. So this is Corsair number 5, or F4U number 5, RL96. And that's what you need to tell the judge. You just need to say, hey, this is Corsair F4U number 5. Okay? Oh, this is good. This is good, yeah. sir. Damien, I know you're causing trouble. Will Tom Hanks be flying this doomed aircraft? I vote for Tom Hanks for the official mate center doomed pilot. If, you know what, Damien? I, I think if, we should have a contact. If you can if you can get Tom Hanks to come to our competition, sounds great. Okay, so after you've identified the aircraft using tail structure, so the next part is removing the debris from the aircraft. So here's the debris that's sitting on top of the engine. And the first thing you need to do is you need to Attach your lift bag to this, pick this up, and move it. So you can build your lift bag as you want. I actually, we have found upstairs at the main center storage, this is a professional lift bag. So you fill it with air, and it comes up, and I added a little hook on the bottom. So the first thing you're going to do is attach the lift bag to the debris. So you come down, got a little hook here, I've got a U-bolt. I could hook it around the pipe if I wanted to, but I'm going to hook it around the U-bolt just to be safe. There you go, so you get points for that. The next thing you're going to do is inflate the lift bag. So this one, now you can have, um, if you pass the fluid power course, you can use a, a pump um, that you plug in, you know, a, a compressor. But I haven't done that, so I'm just going to use a little hand pump. So if you haven't passed the fluid power quiz or don't pass it, you can still use a hand pump like this. And, of course, I could use a couple more sets of hands, but this will go up in here. And essentially, as I pump here, it goes down here and into 
this airbag. And again, you can design your airbag any way you want. And so this would be hooked onto here, hooked onto there. And then as I pump, of course the air is escaping, but normally this would come up. And you are going to get, as you fill this, you're going to get lift and you're going to compensate for this. And this is going to start to come up. So you're filling this, lifting this off. And then once it's off, you just have to set it down. So for this one, let's say I get it mostly full top, compensated for this way. So it's up here, then my arm will be lifted. And this one, this is a professional one. So I can actually pull this and it lets the air out to drop it back down. Okay? So once I've done that, once I've moved it from here, you play this lift bag to lift it up a little bit, drop it back down, you can do that. Now, you can use your engines to help you move this, but you do have to put some air in it. So if, let's say you have a super strong, robust ROV that can lift all this weight. You can put a little air in here and use your ROV, but you do need some air in your lift bag. Okay? And yes, question? Okay, yes, yes. Zoe asks, hey Zoe, are commercial lift bags allowed to be purchased rather than making one? Yes, you, 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 can, you can get one. Yeah, you can buy one if, if you want. We got another question. From Lisa, Lisa, it's you again. Hey, I, I recognize your icon here. What type of fitting will be on the compressor at the competition so that we know how to attach our airline? That, that I don't know. We'll get that information for the international competition. We'll get that information out. Um, you wanna to talk to your regional coordinator if they're gonna be providing a compressor or for a lot of regionals, you may just wanna um, supply your own. So that's for your regional, that's a question for your regional coordinator for the international. We'll figure that out and get that information to you. Cool. Oh, okay. So the next thing is, now you could have two lift bags. You could have this one on here or then release it up to the surface, or you could use the same one. And I only have one lift bag, so I'm gonna do the same thing. So once I've moved the debris, I'm gonna get the same lift bag, and now we have to lift the engine. And so let's get this milk crate, and we've got this U-bolt on one side, so we're gonna kind of do the same thing. We're going to attach a lift bag to the aircraft, I'm using my hook, and you don't have to have a hook, you can use whatever attachment method you want. Get that U-bolt, and again, I'm gonna pump air down in there. This is gonna fill with air, and when I get enough air, this is gonna go up to the surface, okay? And then once it's at the surface, you have to push it back to the side of the pool. And once it's at the side of the pool, in grasp of your team members, a team member, you get your points. And then, of course, you have to return all your lift bags. So let's say, you use two lift bags, one's still on here, one's there. We just want all lift bags out of the pool at the end of the mission, so you get some points for that. Got some questions, are yes. you ready? Good time. Hey Ned, Ned, Ned is from Carolina, North Carolina. Hey Ned, in the Ranger Competition Manual, in section, I love this, in section 3.6.2, pneumatic power, it states that all lines, fittings, and pneumatic devices must be rated for a minimum pressure of 2.5 times the maximum supply right. pressure. Does this requirement apply to any air supply? Um, I would have to check on this, but most for, for wait, this... Wait, it keeps going. Okay. Sorry, I had to make it bigger. To any air supply hose that will be incorporated into the tether for Ranger, does that air supply hose need to be rated at 2.5, the maximum pressure of the mate provided compressed air source? <sighs> I know, that's, take a good, it that, that's a good right? question. I'll, I'll, I'll have to look and, and think about that. Um, Ned, will you do us a favor? Yes. Can you put that question on the FAQ, the forum yeah. board? Yeah. Hopefully, you know how to get there. But if you could put that there, that way Matt can give you an equally right. thorough and well thought out answer to your question. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, yes. But, but generally, yeah, for comp if you're using a compressor, yes. But also, you know, with this system, since this is open on the bottom, all this lift bag at least is open on the bottom. So if you put lots and lots of air in here, so it's going to spill out the bottom. So this technically will never get above ambient. So if it's down, it'll be under a little bit of pressure, but never above the ambient pressure. So this, you know, unless you have a totally enclosed system, which I don't think would work, um, you can use something like this because it has a hole at the bottom to let any excess air out. Okay, and Patrick Pro is hey, Patrick. again. Patrick. To calculate the lift bag capacity, what is the estimated weight in water of the item to be lifted? Um, it's in the manual. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it was posted in the manual. I believe. Oh my gosh, I, I, I it's don't in the remember. Manual. It's in the manual. Who can find it? Whoever finds it in the manual, type it yeah. into the comment section yeah. of this Facebook Live. Yeah, and oh my gosh. I'm, How about that? Yeah. Who's on it? Who's going to do it? Yeah. 
Come on, come on, Nick. I believe, this, on, Lisa, I on, believe this one's around 36 on, newtons. I think this one's around 45 newtons, but that's working from memory. Okay, we'll see who okay. gets it. We'll see. Any other questions on the airplane task? Okay, again, if you have questions, so I'll try and get to them later. But next, now we're going to move on to task two, earthquakes. And for earthquakes, your team is designing your own. Oh, yes, I'm going to come over here and grab some water. Yeah, Matt and I are, are we're, yeah. everyone here, like everyone across the country, we're trying to not get sick, to stay well. So we're trying okay. to hydrate. So it's really up to you to design and build your own OBS, Ocean Bottom Seismometer. And what you need is you need some parts. So you need um, the base unit, which is just kind of an anchor sitting on the bottom. You need a flotation package, which I built. I'm using just a two inch T and some flotation here. And then a connection uh, area here. And you are going to need, so your coordinator may want this beforehand or just the day of. You need to write up a one page description of this. Essentially, kind of what you used to do with a picture, how you're doing your release, things like that. So we're going to start, and I'm going to do a manual. But anyway, you're going to have this on the surface, and a diver is going to take it down for you and set it on the bottom. Now, you want to build your OBS robust enough so that a diver taking it down the bottom is not going to break apart. So, you know. Our divers aren't going to be rough handling it too much, but if you have something really delicate, um, that may not work best for you. And you can, of course, give your diver some instructions. So for this one, the first one, the manual pull, you could just tell the diver, hey, if it comes apart, this just goes through the chain here, out the other hole. So the diver's going to take this down, and you, of course, need your connector connected to it, set it on the bottom. And then the diver is going to insert this into the power and communication hub for you, just like that. And so when the mission starts, this is kind of what you're going to see. Your OBS with your connector. Now the connector, you can, I don't say design any way you want. You know, we put some specifications in there, but I added this grab point, just a uh, number six screw hook. Added another one at the back. But you can add whatever grip point, grab point you want. Um, I'll talk about why I added this Velcro in, in a bit. So when you come to your station, the diver will have set it up like this. And the first thing you need to do is you need to remove this from the power and communication side. So you just have to pull this out like this, and you get points. Now, you also have to close the door, and you have to put this in your OBS, because this actually has to come to the surface when you release your OBS. So closing the door, and then one of the reasons I put Velcro on here, it's kind of hard to see, but if you can look in there, I've got some other Velcro right here. So when this goes up to the surface, I don't want this falling out because you'll actually lose those points if this falls out, the five points for putting it in. So anyway, this will be sitting like this in the water. And so I just designed this. So I come here, and when I get it far enough in, I've got a Velcro, Velcro stick, so it won't shake out. Now, the next part is you need to release the top part, the OBS, the connector flotation package, up to the surface. And there's a couple ways you can do this. So if you're just doing a manual pull, that's worth the uh, fewest amount of points, 10 points, I believe. And for this case, I just, as I said, I have a chain here on the bottom, got a tent state going through here, and if I pull this out, this will go to the surface and I get 10 points, okay? But there are some other ways to do this as well. So I built an alternative. If you have something that's powered that you're sending a signal to, you can do that as well. So let me... Make some quick adjustments on my build OBS. Hey, Matt, while you're doing that, yes. i got a quick question. Yeah. From Mike. Hi, Mike. Chicago, near Chicago. Does only the ROV have to move the engine to the pool edge in Michigan? Yes. Uh, one? <clears throat> yeah, so if, let's say um, you have maybe a string or something on your OBS, you have to use your ROV to push it. You can't pull it in by hand. Awesome. I hope that answers the question, yeah. And, and can I ask another one? Yeah. This is from Lisa. Hey, Lisa. The PV inside the milk crate, is it 25 centimeters or 20 centimeters? Page 28, the competition manual says 20. The diagram show 25. The, the, the which one? The PVC inside the milk crate. Inside the OBS yes. milk crate? Yeah. Um, I, it probably looks like 25. It might have been 20. You know, the, you're... Okay, so anyway, here's another, this is another OBS. I've got some flotation up in the top, so this should float. And for this one, <laughs> I want 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a motor to pull something out. I'm going to have essentially a motor to pull that pin out. So I'm going to push some rope down through there. I'm going to put just a chunk of PVC through here. Comes out that far side. And then so I have a motor. So now I will tell you when I'm designing things, I actually try not to design something very big. So I don't want you copying my des this design because honestly, it's not a great design. But anyway, what I did is I have some string and I have a motor because I decided, what do I know about motors underwater? I know these motors really well because these are what we use a lot, these little bilge pump motors. So what I do is I just left on the impeller and hopefully as I turn this on and it turns, it's gonna spin this and this would of course be hard down out here and it's gonna pull that out, hopefully. Okay, now the question is how do I activate this motor? And you can do it a couple ways. One way would be with a magnet and magnetic reed switch, which I have set up here. And so essentially this is a normally open magnetic reed switch, which means the circuit is usually broken, but when I get a magnet near it, it connects that circuit up. So my magnet is lost. Ah, there it is. Okay, so if this was here, we're gonna see if this works. So I get a magnet close to this, it pulled that out, right? And so this, of course, would be flotation. It'd go up to the surface. So for activation, I used a magnet and magnetic reed switch. That would get me 20 points. But you could design something where instead of a magnet here, you're using um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, something like that. So you would have a container down there with a receiver. Your Wi-Fi um, Bluetooth transmitter would be on your ROV. And let's say your transmitter, uh, I mean your receiver goes, hey, if I receive the code 12345, I'm going to open something up and I'm going to, that will release this to float to the surface. And of course your transmitter on your RV, you'd go down and you'd transmit one, two, three, four, five, hopefully it would receive it and this would go up to the surface. You can also use acoustics. So let's say you use a little snippet of sound. Now I will warn you, pools are very noisy places. So I wouldn't go, hey, if my receiver, if my microphone receives a signal in the two, 2000 hertz range, open up because probably going to hear that. So you may want to use a series of tones, you know, maybe a snippet from your favorite song, something like that. But essentially, as you transmit sound, your receiver picks up that sound. You're going to need some sort of uh, little Arduino or something down there to interpret it, open something up and send this to the surface. Okay. So there's lots of ways you can do this. I showed you kind of the two potentially simplest ways you can do this mission. Ah, a little short circuit. Okay. Any questions about that? And again with this one, as I say, be creative. Um, we really left this um, open so you can be creative, design your own thing. Okay. All right, we got a question from just up the road. Hi, Victor. Victor from Watsonville, Aptos area. He says, ask, excuse me, on the airplane mission, can the ROV stay attached to the object while the lift bag lifts? Or does it have to release so, it to prove to the judges the airbag did the lifting? So for the... For the debris, you can still be attached, but for the engine, and yeah, I should have said this, when this engine goes up, when you've inflated the lift bag and this engine goes up, your ROV needs to stay down. I mean, it can come up slowly, but if it gets dragged up with it, so if you're still attached and your ROV gets dragged to the surface with your lift bag, for the engine, you are gonna get a penalty of five points. So your lift bag should be independent as this engine goes up the surface, you should, you know, if you have a claw or whatever, it should go up and your ROV should stay down on the bottom. Now you can drive up and then push it to the side. Okay? All right. Okay, so we're going to move on. Let me get all this get out of the way. Get a drink of water. Yep. I hope everyone's staying well out there in the rest yeah. of the world. Yeah. Okay, so task three, energy. So for the task three energy, there's a lot of equipment to install, but the first thing you're going to do is using the tidal data and nautical charts to determine the optimum location for a tidal turbine. So hopefully you will have you will have Wi-Fi at your region and you can get onto deepzoom.com. So here, hopefully this shows up well. This is deepzoom.com. And we're looking at six points at the north end of Puget Sound. So as I scroll out, we've got you know, Seattle is right down in here, ah, a little lower than this. But here's Puget Sound, top end of Puget Sound, right near Port Townsend. We have this block, Admiralty Inlet, and these are the six points we're looking at. And so as you go through the day, 
And this is today, this is January 31st. You can see what, tide, what the tide is doing at these six points. Okay? And now what you need to do is you need to determine over this day which of these six points has the highest tide swing. So as we look at this, and we want to kind of, if you want to do it, you could, there's little numbers associated with it, and you could figure out the highest for each number at each tide. So if, let's look at this one. As I go, it gets up to 5.1 before going down. So at this tide, 5.1. This one, this one gets up to 6.8. This one looks like it's at 3.4 is its high. So you can get the highest one at that tide range. Now next one, not quite as big, but this one gets up to 3.4. This one maxes out at 2.6. This one maxes out at 2.6. So you can get, you know, you can get all these numbers. You can add up. And there's going to be four tides during the day. So this is a third tide. Green is incoming. This one, not a very strong tide. Current, this one only gets up to 2.5. And anyway, oh, there's a big outgoing late that night. So this one gets up to, to 4.5. But anyway, you can see all these numbers, and you can get the maximum for each of the four tide sets and add those together. Or you can just look, and I'll tell you as I look at this, it's this top middle one that always gets the biggest tide. So what you would report to your judge is that this top middle one is the highest tide currents during the day. Okay? We have a couple questions yeah. from yes. past two. Can we go back there? Yeah, yeah past right. two. So Tristan, hey Tristan, he asked, so the release, or she, she, excuse me, he, she. So the release mechanism has to be on the OBS itself and not on its base. Well, the release mechanism depends. So actually, this release mechanism was actually on the base for this. So the, if I did this powered one, I would probably mount this. So it would pull out, but the OBS, the OBS and the connector have to go to the surface. So you could put your, um, your disconnect on this part and it could go up as well or it could leave it down on the bottom okay and i do want to point out i should have talked about this a little bit but the first one where i just pulled the pin didn't need any fire i'm looking at back computer <laughs> this computer. um didn't need any power just pulled that pin and it went up on itself if you are using power to do this this is going to be considered a um, non-ROV device, NRD. So there are some power rules, and you could power this from the surface. So just for this example, I could have wires that go all the way to the surface, and I could power this. So I use a 9-volt battery, but you could use a 12-volt battery source, um, and there are some limits with amperage. But you could power this from the surface, or this is a year we're actually uh, letting students uh, put power on the water. So I could technically encapsulate all of this, my power source down in a um, container down there, a cylinder or something, and have power on board so I don't have all those wires going out. But if you do that, there's some very specific rules you have to follow about onboard power. Okay, so just if, if you are doing power, uh, look at the uh, NRD section in the um, electricity section, just about non rov devices. Okay, any other questions on test two? I think, you know, I'm, there was a question from Michael. Hi, Michael, but I think you just answered okay, it. Yeah, so I yeah. asked him if, if you, um, oh, wait, he does. Wait okay. a second. Hold on. Can power source run separate from Teta? So, yes, if, if you are running this, if you're running a power source here, it should be separate from your Tether. Now, let's say you're doing, let's say you're doing Wi-Fi Bluetooth. You'd, have, of course, have your Bluetooth powered on your ROV, but the Bluetooth receiver on this side would be powered independently. We don't want that running through the ROV um, just because we want to make sure that, that you know, it's, it's actually um, the Wi-Fi or whatever transmitting that's, that's doing the release. That's awesome. Patrick says this is great. Patrick Gannon, so yep. we appreciate that. Tristan says it's a he. Okay. Hi, and, Tristan. He, Tristan. And I will say, just, just some background on this. This whole kind of um, release thing, um, you know, with Wi-Fi and stuff, you know, kind of introducing teams, especially at the upper levels of Wi-Fi, is because one of our local institutions, at uh, Ambari, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, is looking at getting student projects down there that maybe can do some Wi-Fi release so they don't have to buy a really high end connector to do this data. So, so that's kind of where all this is coming from. Some pretty neat stuff happening out there. Okay. So anyway, um, you figured out which of these six points is the biggest side. Now, one thing you will notice is the other aspect is kind of hard to see on here, but it can't be in a cable area. It's kind of really hard to see. Let me see if I can get in here. But from here to here across is cable area, and you'll see it marked. So actually, this one would never work because it's in a cable area. 
This one's right on the edge, so I'd actually say it's close enough to the edge that you could put something there. Um, so this is your cable area and the rest of it out here would be good. So actually, this one probably wouldn't be ever used because it's in a cable area. Okay. All right, question from Craig. <coughs> yes. Can, do we use the location with the highest maximum tide flow or the highest average? The highest, tide flow? the How highest, important? it's actually the highest combined. So essentially there are going to be four maximums during a day. So generally, you know, ties during a day in most places, you get an in, an out, and in, and an out. So you're going to take the maximum of the two outs and the maximum tide flow of the two ins at each of these, and those are the numbers you're going to use. Okay, hopefully that answered it. But for the next part, so the next part is using current data to calculate the maximum possible megawatt generation. So actually, as we looked at this, our biggest title, well, we chose this top center one, and over this day, over January 31st, our biggest tide was, we get up to five something there, but our biggest tide was, let me use this, this is sliding a little better, was right in here. So actually we got up to, this one got up to 6.8 knots today, so out there. So we're actually going to use that for our next part. So let's kind of come on over here, we're going to do some math, some more math. Let me run down and get my pen so we can follow along. Should teams bring their own pens and pencils, Matt? So, so I, I would highly recommend, my guess is your coordinator may provide those, but I would highly recommend bringing your own ruler, your own protractor, your own calculator, some scratch paper, pen, so you can do all this. Because for those of you who have done this before, it can sometimes get chaotic, and the team before you might have walked off with a pen or a protractor or something. So I would recommend bringing your own. And again, ask your coordinator, and honestly, I think at the Monterey, we're just regional. We're just going to rely on you to bring everything you need yourself. Okay? Okay, so what we're doing is we're looking at this equation to do the maximum current. And this is in the manual, so you'll probably want to have this written down. So the power is N, which is the number of rotors, times half times rho, density of water, salt water, times the area of the rotors, times the velocity cubed, times the um, efficiency of the generator. So some of these you'll know or calculate, and some you won't. So number one, N, number of rotors. Now in the manual, we showed six rotors, but you are going to use this. So you can count the rotors on there. There are four rotors on this uh, tidal array. Okay, so for N, your N is going to be four. So rho is always going to be the same. So the density of seawater, even if it might slightly change where you are, we're going to use 1.025. For that, the area. So for the area, we're going to give you, we're going to provide you the diameter of the rotor. So the diameter of, of a rotor is, we're going to say 16 meters here. Now we're not actually using this diameter. We're going to use what they might use out in the real world. So you'll get this sheet, which will have the diameter of rotors is 16 meters. The efficiency of the turbines is 32 percent. This isn't going to change, but we'll give it to you anyway. Now for tide, we looked in the highest tide level at that point was 6.8 knots. Of course, we don't want knots. We want um, meters per second. So let's go back to the computer really quick. I had this called up. Really easy to find. Knots to meters per second. 6.8. Okay. So our meters per second is 3.498. We're going to call that 3.5. So we're going to use 3.5 meters per second. Now, we're going to go through and do the math. So we have, oh, actually I have it here. So we have N equals 4, rho equals 1.025. The swept area, so the diameter was 16. That means the radius is 8. We're going to use pi r squared. And so the swept area of one rotor is about 201 square meters. Now, 6.8 knots, we converted that to 3.5 meters per second. We're cubing that, so 3.5 times 3.5 times 3.5 equals 42.875. And our CP, 32%, 0.32. So when we add, uh, multiply all these together, four rotors times half times density times swept area times velocity cubed times efficiency, we come out with 5.653 megawatts of generation is the maximum it'll generate at that, during that day, okay? And so you'll just kind of show your work and, um, and show the judge that answer, okay? Any questions on that? Okay, perfect. So again, oh, 
Yeah, yeah, again, uh, yeah, go for it. No, you go okay. first. You go first. Yep. So again, you know, if you don't want to do this math, put it in Excel or some other program to do all the math for you if you want. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Okay. I just want to say, I can see that Marty Klein joined us. Hi, Marty. It's so good to have you with us. And I will tell you, Marty Klein, huge supporter of the Make Competition. Uh, comes and judges every year at the New England Regional and also at the International. And um, he just celebrated, it's been 50 years since he established his side skin sonar company, Client Associates. And so congratulations, <coughs> Marty. And thanks for joining us. And thanks for being such a huge supporter of all that we do. All right. Had Same. to do it. Yep. I saw no, him no, no. in there. I had to. Same to do. Hi, Marty. Glad you can tune in. Okay. So once we've kind of done all the math up top, we're going to start installing equipment. And we're going to start with installing the Tyler Ray, the base of it. So it's going to be on the surface, and you're going to put it down. Now we have somewhat color-coded things, so the red base is going in this red square. And you can carry this down. Now there aren't a lot of grip points, so you can grab it any way you want. And you're going to set it down in the square. So it has to be all the way in. So that would work, but that wouldn't. So it has to be, you got to get it all the way down in that square, okay? So that would work. That would work as well any way you want to do it. So the next part is you are going to be installing the array onto the base. So this is on the surface as well. It's got a U-bolt as a grab point. You can take this down and drop it in there any way you want. Okay, and it's going to sit like that. And then you need to latch the array in place. So I know we got some questions about this, you know, how to build this on the FAQ board. So once you have it like this, all you're going to be do is you're going to turn this handle. And by turning this handle, it pulls this latching mechanism up and over. And there you go. So that'll be last. So once this is up and over and touching that, you're good. And this is built. So this is just tall enough to be out of the way. So it's not going to be in the way there. Okay. So that is latching it. Okay. Question. Yes. Kristen, great question. Important one too. Will computers be provided to find the tide data or should we bring our own? I, again, that's a question probably for your original, but I would recommend bringing your own. Now, I do want to go back and say, I don't know where I left it, but depending on where your original is, you may not have an internet connection. And if you don't have an internet connection, you're actually going to get something like this. Uh, so if, if you can ask your coordinator, but if internet just isn't working there, I know some, some places we, you go, you just don't get that. You're going to get something like this, which actually has four tide sets on it with the numbers. And you can just add these up. Okay. Uh, no, you cannot modify a mate center prop okay. by adding a, a handle to it. Got it. Another one. Another one. Sorry, yes. it's coming in. They're coming in. That's Are good. the turbines That's good. at the bottom of the pool close by to the red square? That's from Gavin. The, the, these, tur these turbines will be on the surface. So this will be up on the surface. So this, essentially, I should have said this before, but anything you kind of see up on the desk, is this is on my surface side of the pool. So this would be on the surface, you carry this down, and you know, I might go, hey, here's a nice grab point. I have something to grab it here. And I'm all tangled up. So I might grab it here, set it down in there, something like that. Or you know, I could even maybe grab it by here. So, because since this is on the surface, I can put it in my gripper there I want. So maybe I'm gonna grab it here, set it in there, and just give it a little push that way so it falls open the right way. I hope that answered it. And then again, of course, just uh, so it's complete, doing that and that. Perfect. Got another one from okay. Victor. Hey, Victor, just up the road. In the current mission, does the latch have to be moved by the handle? No, it does. The latch does not have to be moved by the handle. You can uh, do it any way you want. The handle, the handle's there just in case, because it might be easier for you. Hey, Emma Bennett, thank you. She says thank you from the Smithsonian Tethered Exo Mariner STEM ROV team in Florida. You are welcome, Woo! Emma. You are welcome. Yeah, that's a long name, but you are very welcome. Okay, so um, we have this installed. So the next thing we're going to go on to is installing the Intelligent Adaptable Monitoring Package, the IAMP, to monitor the area. So we've done a scout and navigator one of this, and I say it every time. This is actually a really cool piece of equipment. It's essentially a big array of sensors they set down that'll monitor the area. And especially because if you have turbines turning and something critical comes through there, like a marine mammal up in Washington State, if a bunch of salmon are swimming by, you don't want them to get in the turbines. 
So this can actually, they, they've designed this, and there's a video, if you look in our resources, there's a video on this. It can actually shut down the turbine so whatever animals can get by safely. So it's a really cool bit of equipment. Okay, but this is what we have for our IM. And this will be, again, beyond the surface. We've got a U-bowl, but you can carry it any way you want. So you can carry it down, and you're gonna set it on the sand. And again, we've got a little color-coordinated co yellow IM goes on the yellow base. And this needs to go into the little stand here. So the stand, we've got these nice little uh, half two inch tees and it'll get set down in there. So this would work, you can get it all the way that way, or all the way that way, but if you get it too much over and it falls off, you can't have it. So this actually needs to be, the feet need to be in those holders and it needs to be standing just like that, okay? And then you need to push the locking mechanism, which is right over here, so it'll be set up this way. And then you just push this, and it latches over those feet. Okay? Cool. Yep. Motor along. Okay. So the next part is placing a mooring a given distance from the base. So we have this long line with some tape on it, it is going to be our distance measurement. And our zero area, so we have one little red knob sticking up, kind of hard to see, but this one. The very center of this is a zero mark. So what you're measuring, you're going to measure out along this a certain distance, but as I said, the very center of this is your zero mark. So, there's lots of ways you can do this. I'm doing something really simple. I'm going to pull a tape measure. I have a little hook on the end of it. So I'm going to hook this around here. Now one thing is, the judge is going to give you a distance. And I know for me, from here to here, it's about 10 centimeters. So, the judge, in this instance, is going to tell me that I want to measure out 1.49 meters, so 149 centimeters. But I actually know, since this adds 10, I'm actually going to pull this out only to 139 centimeters, and this is my extra 10. And of course, I tell the judge that. So when the judge sees that we're looking at the mark at 139, he knows that, hey, we got it right. So, hooking that around, pulling this out. Ah, here we go, 139. So it's essentially right at the start of this mark, which is red and blue tape next to each other. So I know this mark, or so, or this point right here is about 139, or sorry, 149 centimeters out, even though this tape measure only says 139, there's that plus 10 down there. Okay? So once I've measured that, the next thing I need to do is up on the surface, we are going to have the mooring. And so the mooring has a base, there's gonna be, just put some rebar in here, I don't have any today, but just some rebar in here to give it a little more weight. You have this chain, which will go up to the surface, and in the middle, you have your float at the surface, and here in the middle you have a U-bowl. So this distance that this is, is gonna be the depth of the pool plus about 10 centimeters. So essentially, just the top of this should be sticking out the top of the pool. Now, I don't have this one very long just because it gets ungainly when I'm doing it not in a pool. But anyway, you're gonna carry this down, and you're gonna set it near this mark. So our mark was the blue and red, so it's going to go right here. So it's, this is the mark, you can go on this side, you can go on this side, you can go near it, you can go over it, however you want to do it. But you want to get this mooring down here. And again, this is going to be floating up to the surface, okay? And the judge will tell you when you're closer. So you know, if you get it way out here, the judge will be like, nah, you need to get a little closer. So we're going to get it right about there, okay? Hey, Matt, can I ask you a yes. question about the I am frame? Yes. Okay, well, Mike actually wants to ask you the question. Will there be elbows on the locking mechanism for the I am frame if yes. the locking mechanism does not fall out? Yes. Yes. So so I know in the in the pictures these weren't in there, but um, in the description it was. So yeah, there's these. And it also not only helps lock it in, but it helps it slide over. So just in case... It's a little higher for some reason. It actually is nice and it slides right over that. So it gives you a little curve there. Okay, so once you have your mooring down, this is going to be floating up. And the next thing you need to do is you need to determine the height of this. So this is going to be floating up. This will be floating up here. So you need to determine the height. And you need to determine the height right to the middle of the U-bolt. So that's where we're going to do. So for this one, I'm going to use a tape measure again. I'm going to turn this into a hook. And I actually measured, and we're gonna, I'm gonna use this as my, my top. So I'm gonna go here, and this is not a great mechanism for this. But I know I measured beforehand, side of the pool, 
And I know that this, we're about 18 centimeters up. With this hook, I've got about five centimeters. So let's call it 23 centimeters that I already have. So I'm gonna pull this up. Like I said, this will be, won't have a foot in the way. And so I'm gonna measure, and I measured this at, well, my tech measure is reading 135, but I know that it's 23 centimeters above that because it's a height, I'm not measuring from the very bottom. You do wanna measure from the very bottom. So 135 plus 23 would be 158, I think, check my math. And so that would be the height that you reported to judge. You would say this U-bolt is 158 centimeters above the bottom. Okay? Awesome. Now, the next thing you need to do is you need to develop, build, design your own ADB, ADP, which is an acoustic Doppler velocimeter, ADV, and you need to attach it on the market. So you need to attach your home built ADV. Now it doesn't actually have to be an ADV, it just needs to be a chunk of equipment. And you're gonna to have to attach it to this U-bolt. Tighten up my U-bolt's gotten loose. Okay, so you can design it however you want. Now I designed one and there are some parameters. I think it has to be about 20 centimeters long. This one's about 21. So I just have a chunk of pipe. You can put a little flotation in here. And so for me attaching it, I'm gonna do a super difficult way to attach it. I'm actually gonna have my manipulators tie a knot in this rope around the U-bolt. I don't recommend this design. Um, if you have a manipulator that can tie knots, that's great, but it's probably really hard. So right, this is gonna be up here. I'm going to put this through here. Use my great manipulators to tie a knot. I'm going to tie a square knot because I was a Boy Scout once upon a time. Yay! And there we go. Yep. So there we go. Now my ADV is attached to the mooring, which is at this height. Okay? And again, design your own. You can design your own um, mechanism to get it on here. Be creative. And again, I don't want to give away any good designs because that's, that's you and your team get to design something really great. It's probably going to fall off. Okay. So the last part of this is the eelgrass habitat monitoring and restoration. So again, we've color-coded things that eelgrass is green. There's going to be two eelgrass samples down on the bottom. And there's also going to be two eelgrass, I forgot what we call them. Frames. Frames. Yep. On the surface. And so essentially these are ones that are, the frames are being transplanted back down. The samples are coming back up. So you can do this in any order, but your two samples that you need to grab, and you're bringing up the whole thing. So don't eat, like we had someone ask, do you chop something off? No, you're not chopping anything off, you're bringing up the whole thing. And of course, underwater, this is foam flotation, so this will float, and it'll look more like that. So that actually looks kind of like some medial grass. So you're bringing these two, set them on the side, and then you're bringing these two. And so the frames have a little bit of this plastic, one inch plastic mesh. And those are going down and they need to go all the way in to the designated area. So that would work, but the base needs to be all the way in. So that would not work because it's a little bit out. Okay? So that's it for the missions. I do have a couple other things to talk about, but if you have more questions about the missions, uh, type it in now because we're coming up near an hour and uh, getting near the end. Yep. So <clears throat> I did want to talk some about the order of tasks. Now, I did this in order, and there are some things you need to do in order. So the airplane task, you pretty much need to do those in order. You can skip a task, um, or you can skip a, a step if you want, but you can't come back and, and do it later. For the OBS, it's, well, it's pretty much that one logically. You have to get your connector back and on your OBS before you can release it to the surface, things like that. For task three, you need to do your calculations with deep zoom and your tidal calculations first. Again, you can skip it, but if you do, you can't go back. But then once you have that, then you can go down and place all this equipment. You can place this equipment in any order you want. So you could measure out from here first and deploy your mooring first, and then come over and do this part, then come over and do this part. Or you could bring this down, set in here. Well, let's get in there properly. Set in here, go do something else. And now the eelgrass, this is the eelgrass, all of the tasks can be done completely out of order. So, um, so you can do the eelgrass at any time before, um, before you even do the tight stuff. So the eelgrass is kind of totally independent. Now, 
you don't have to start with the airplane test. You can start with any test you want. So you could start with the OBS. I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about why you might wanna start with the ocean bottom seismometer first before moving on to the other things. And so this is a little hint. A couple of these tasks don't actually require the ROV to be involved. So all the math, the figuring out where the airplane crashed, ROV doesn't have to be involved in that. That's just all math. You're gonna get that at the start of your mission. All this tidal data stuff and figuring out the energy generation, you don't need the ROV for that. So a hint, maybe a recommendation is, your ROV pilot can start flying, <laughs> but have someone start on the tide stuff, have someone starting on the aircraft stuff while your pilot's going down and doing something else. So they may, the pilot may want to start with this stuff. Once you get your calculations done, then you can move on to the other stuff, okay? Can I ask a question? Yes. Okay, so Craig wants to know, how secure does the ADV need to be? Does it need to be attached such that it can't be shaken off? Or is it fine as long as it stays on? Generally, as long as it stays on, and, and usually for things like this, if it's on for about five seconds after you've moved away, you get your points, the judge isn't gonna take away points for that. So generally, I would say five seconds, once your RV's moved away and disengaged, that falls off after that, you'll be okay. Okay. Another question. Okay. Ben. Ben. Hey, Ben. Can we move both eelgrass samples at once? Yes. So. Question. Ben. Yes. So I was, was going to get to that. I might have forgotten it. But yeah, you can do lots of things at once. So let's say you have a really great ROV and you want to carry. Let's say you have all this stuff and you want to go down and you want to go. Boom, put that in there, do that, put these in here, grab the other two, come back up. Or let's say, let's say you have a really good RV and you're carrying all this stuff at once, that's fine. So you don't, you don't have to come back up and down for every individual item if you can carry everything down at once. This is my favorite question. Okay. I'll let you answer. Okay. Marty wants to know, well, someone from Boston wants to know what that strange beast is on my shirt. I don't know. What is that on your shirt? <laughs> Marty, I was going to tell you, I hope we're friends after this weekend. Yeah. I know we will be. I know we will be. All good sports. So, Matt, the yes. correct answer is the next Super Bowl champion. Exactly. Come exactly. on. Yes. My team didn't even make it. Sorry. Okay. okay. Humor. No, this is a legitimate question okay. from Nicola. Nicola, you always tune in. It's so good to see you. Um, well, hear from you. See your writing. Mm -hmm. Can we use a basket to bring yes. grass to the surface instead of the ROV? So yes, the, the answer to that is you can use a collection basket. You can actually pull a collection basket up and down by hand, but that collection basket does count as debris. So if it's in the water at the end of your mission time, you will get a penalty for that. But yes, you can use that to bring things up and down. Except this, it actually says it was this year, the title tomorrow you need to carry down with your ROV. Good question. Okay. Now we have one, this came up earlier and I asked him to pull it to the end. Okay. Um, and I'm not, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to butcher this pronunciation of your name, Mom Dua. So pardon, pardon. What are the specifications of the power, of the onboard power container? And I think he means, are we The, the NRD. Yes. So, so if, Thank you. For, for the OBS, if you're using a non-ROV device, there are specifications. So the, essentially, you can read the exact specifications, but if you have power inside a watertight cylinder, what we don't want is because it happened once in a while, uh, many years ago, if those batteries get wet, certain kinds of batteries, they start off-gassing, and if you have a container down there that's watertight, and you have something off-gassing in there, it creates a little bomb. So essentially, what, what the rules for that mean is, if pressure starts building up inside your container, one of the end caps have, has to pop off. So if you're doing that, my suggestion is you can get like an O-ring, maybe some uh, grease around there, and you just push that end cap on. There's no screws or fasteners or anything like that. So if pressure starts building up, it's going to pop off. And what's actually holding that on to keep your container dry is just the pressure in the pool. So if you just have, a, a, let's say, a cylinder and an end cap that just slides on one side, um, the pressure is going to hold that on there so it just doesn't fall off but um, it does have to be able to come off. Okay. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, wait a second. Oh. Yes. Kurt wants to know, I hope this is a current, 
one half inch or one inch mesh? The, oh, for, for the, um, the eel grass, this is one inch square mesh on here. And it's actually, that's the, that's the inside square, so it's actually each square is a touch more because it has some plastic. But, and it's four by four, so four squares by four squares on here. Okay. Yeah, sorry if that is not earlier. So, in our work, there are some other things I was going to talk about. Um, the OBS design document. So you do need to have, you might need to turn it early, depending on the regionals and the international. But a one-page document describing your ocean bottom seismometer. Essentially, a picture of it, you know, what's your anchor, what's your OBS package, and the release mechanism. And if you're, it's not required earlier, you still want that because um, you're, probably your size and weight judges are gonna check that. Um, SIDS, of course, competition day, bring all your SIDS, especially if you're using a non-ROV device, um, you want a SID for that. If you have power on your OBS release, we need a separate SID uh, for that. Now, real quick, I just, I went through the rules as well, and we had a couple pretty significant rule changes here that I just wanna go over. Um, and number one is, this year, propellers need to be completely um, shrouded and have thruster guards to IP12 um, specifications. And um, essentially what that equates to is solid particulate protection level two, which means that you can't get fingers in there. The biggest hole opening I think can be 1.25 centimeters. And what that means is that's not just the back or only part of it or just around the propeller. It has to be completely shrouded so that no fingers can get in there and touch that propeller. Okay. Uh, the next rule, um, new this year, we disallowed circuit breakers. So everyone's going to have to use a fuse. We're not allowing circuit breakers. Some of our safety judges had some concerns about the, some of the circuit breakers that were being used. Um, I talked about non-ROV device power specs. And essentially this year, your OBS for Ranger, your OBS is your NR, NRD, your non-ROV device. So you can't have other things. We just, this year we kind of wanted to get general rules because maybe next year there'll be something similar. But for Ranger class, your NRD is your OBS and only your OBS. If you want, if you want to be. If you don't have a powered one, then it's not. Um, and lastly, if you're using for the lift bag, if you're using any sort of compressor to push air into that lift bag, you are going to have to pass that fluid power quiz. If you don't pass a fluid power quiz, you're going to be limited to essentially a bicycle hand pump, foot pump, something like that, a manual pump. Okay, that is it for me. No, we got um, questions. We got questions. We Let's go for questions. Okay, so the first one from Craig says a basket also counts for part of the ROV size and weight. Correct? It does, yes. So, yes. so yeah, that's what. Yes, it does, not only is it debris if it's in the water, but it has to go through size and weight as well. And essentially, a lot of stuff. I, not your OBS, but you know anything uh, ROV related needs to go through size and weight. All your tools. All right, Lewis. Hey, Lewis. Question from Lewis, does the pilot need to do the aircraft calculations or can a nope. different team member do that as the pilot does something else? No, um, the pilot the pilot can if they want to, but no, I, I would recommend for time-wise, have someone else do that. You know, you get, for Ranger class, you get a team of up to six people on the pool deck. You have probably want a pilot, maybe backup pilot, but you've got some calculations and anyone can do those. Awesome. Your pilot does not have to do those. And Ned, wait, Ned from Carolina, North Carolina. Hey, Ned. Hey again, Ned. Can you talk a little more about the concept of a collection basket and how it could be utilized, please? Okay. So, I'm going to use this. Let's say this is not a very good collection basket, but let's say this is a collection basket, and I want to bring this down um, and put it here. Let's, let's say this lives on here. But I put it here, and now when I'm collecting samples, I can put these in here. And well, I think that's kind of all you're collecting. And then pull this back up. Now, could you use a basket to bring stuff down you, you from could, the yes. surface? You could use a basket, so if you wanted to, I could. Let's say all this stuff's on the surface. And technically these are on the surface, these are underwater. Now again, this is not the best basket for it, but I could design one. I would, well, actually this, this can't go in a basket. This is the auto we have to bring down from the surface. But this could be in there. 
And again, this is not an ideal basket. This could be in there. These could be in there. My ADV a velocimeter could be in there. And so I could then bring this down to the bottom, set it here, and go, that's going there, that's going there, these are going here, these are going here, this is coming out for later, and this comes back up. Cool. Another okay. question from Nicola. Hello, Nicola. She wants to know who does she ask for permission to use a laser? That would you be you. Would I believe you asked this on the FAQ board, or someone did? You asked me, but uh, there's some very specific rules. So go look at specifications 3.10, and it has all the, the rules you need to meet. And then once you think you've met those rules, send your lasers to me. My uh, you can my connection is in there. And uh, I will approve or not approve your laser, depending on what type it is. And Patrick Rowe, that troublemaker, no, I'm just teasing, he asks if a pressure tank can be used. Pressure tank An for? Acclimator. There are rules for pressure tanks, um, de depending on what you're using it for. So what we're not allowing is for, lift, for that airbag, we're not allowing you to use pressurized gas to fill that lift bag from the ROV. So you're actually gonna have to pump air down from the surface for, for filling that lift bag. If you're using an accumulator for something else, um, the rules are in the manual. I don't know them off the top of my head. Another good question from Nicola, an important one too, that yes. it would be good to cover. Can a teammate drop props into the pool? Yes, so you can. Instead of a collecting basket, you just wanna drop them in the pool. You can drop them into the pool, but you can't throw them out. So let's say I wanted to drop my these samples, and here's the side of the pool. I could drop them right here. I couldn't do this. I couldn't go, okay, let's toss them out there, and hopefully they sink in there. See if I can. Yeah, pretty close. But um, you can do that for everything except this. This, it states in the manual that you need to carry this down with your ROV, your tidal turbine array. Got another one. Okay. Mike wants to know, does only the ROV have to bring the tidal turbine base and IAMP to IAMP? Yep. Yes, retrieve it. Well, down or well, up, right? Yeah, if you... well, both, both of those are going down. Um, again, I think as the last person, you could drop these on the side of the pool or have a collection basket. So you could drop them here down to the bottom. You can drop them down to the bottom and then move them out, but yeah, your RV is pretty much doing everything here. I hope that answered. I'm not. I didn't quite get. Yeah. There's something else. Part of that. Might ask again, or if we round this, if we wrap this up, and you don't get a chance to type it in, you can ask it on the FAQ. And of course, I was thinking you might have asked it right before I answered it. Right, 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 right. And it's coming in. Everything's coming yep. in. Yep. It's really, really, really cool. Anything else I'm looking, I'm looking, people are asking, things are good so far. Again, if you missed the opportunity to ask a question or you think of others, post them to the FAQ yep. board, right? Post them to the FAQ board, I get to them occasionally, as Joe kind of mentioned, I, both of us are out of town next week, so I will, I will say, probably not going to answer any questions next week. But um, I'll get to them after that. Yeah, cool. And speaking of next week, I just wanted to give another shout out to Underwater Intervention, the conference that we're attending. You will see Dylan there. Since you're not Ooh. seeing him now, since he's not turning the camera around, he's going to be there. Three other CMATE students are going to be there. You're going to see ROV team members from Copile Lincoln Community College. They're going to be there presenting. You're going to see ROV team members from Stockbridge High School in Michigan. They're going to be presenting. I should mention Compile Lincoln Community College is in Mississippi. Stockbridge in Michigan. You are going to see, um, uh, you'll see Tina, Dr. Tina Miller-Way and Rachel McDonald, who are the Northern Gulf Coast Regional Coordinators. You'll see me, you'll see Matt. I'm trying to think who else you'll see. There'll be a bunch of us down there. So. Um, we hopefully will do some Facebook Lives, or if you happen to be in the New Orleans area, come on over. It's at the Ernest Morial Convention Center in New Orleans. That'll be an exciting time. 
Um, what else did I want to know? I think that's it. You know, this is great. Oh, there was a question. Bob, you asked a great question. Yes, this recording will live on our competition Facebook page. And also what we'll do, and we'll do this with all of the Facebook lives that we do, we record it. We take the recording and we post it to our YouTube and our Vimeo channels. And eventually you will see on, the, for example, they're already up. If you go to the Scout class competition page, you'll see links to the YouTube and the Vimeo Facebook lives. Um, I'll put Get Navigator up there soon. Ranger will be posted soon. And um, when we do Explorer, and we'll do Explorer mid-February, yeah, I think. Yeah. Once we get back from this conference in New Orleans, we'll do Explorer. Was there another yeah, question? Yeah, I did just look uh, real oh. quick. So there, there was a question I was checking. Um, is it deep, it's a deep Zoom website. And actually, if you go into the manual, there's a clickable link on there. And I also want to point out that um, when it came out for Explore class, but there are going to be fly-throughs. I know uh, you oh, mentioned that some yeah, yeah, so yeah. wants to talk about Yeah, thank you. Oh my gosh. So we posted the Explorer fly-throughs. They're up there on the Explorer class competition page. And I will get the Ranger, Navigator, and the Scout up there soon as soon as Kendrick. Hey, shout out to Kendrick in Maryland. Kendrick gets them done and gets them to us. Matt reviews them to make sure they're okay. They're all good. And then we post them up there. So I, I think that we're good before we end, yeah. though. Any more questions? No, I think that was it. Okay, before we end, I'm going to give a shout out to my lady friends, the Philadelphia uh, ladies, the Pennsylvania Regional Coordinators, Velda and Jane Go Eagles. And Damien, I'm going to challenge you, Damien Beretti, if you're still listening. I want you and your students, as we wrap this up, do it for me, Damien. Just sing as loud as you can in your classroom <laughs> the Eagles fight song, okay? I'm sure I'm going to hear it all the way across the country. All right, everyone, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. And don't forget questions to the FAQ board. See ya. <laughs>